James Butler and his opponent Richard Grant fought a charity boxing match in November of 2001 in New York. Butler lost the match by a judge's decision and while Grant celebrated his victory, Butler's boxing gloves were being taken off by his team. Grant soon made his way over to Butler's side of the ring to shake hands and exchange thanks for a good fight. But Butler's reaction would send shockwaves throughout the boxing world. As Grant approached him, instead of shaking hands as is customary after a boxing match, Butler threw a punch with full force to his jaw, wearing only his hand wraps. It was a ruthless sucker punch and the unprepared Grant suffered a dislocated jaw and a lacerated tongue, which needed 26 stitches. Butler was immediately arrested and charged with aggravated assault. He was later convicted and served four months in jail. Grant paused his boxing career for nearly a year while he recovered, but ultimately he was okay and would continue in the sport for six more years. James Butler's childhood was spent in a grimy Harlem housing project with a mother who preferred partying and nightlife to raising her kids. He spent time in foster care and in jail for petty theft. His father was never around, so Butler didn't appear to have any reliable, positive role models growing up. During his time in jail for the sucker punch incident, Butler received a cocktail of medications to deal with bipolar disorder. One of the side effects of these meds was rapid weight gain and Butler had piled on 70 pounds by the time he was released. With four months time served, Butler struggled for a number of years to make a living after his release. So in September of 2004, he turned to a friend for a temporary place to stay. That friend was Sam Kellerman. Ten years earlier, Sam initially met James at a boxing gym in Times Square where his nickname The Harlem Hammer would later prove to be a chilling prediction of things to come. Sam was 18 and a star student at Manhattan's elite Stuyvesant High School. He was creative, quick-witted and known for his kind-hearted nature. One of Sam's teachers had once written him a glowing recommendation as follows. 10,000 students and 34 years have passed since my first day as a teacher and I cannot recall one student of this quality, intelligence and talent. Sam is someone who our world should be proud to know as an example of what humans are all about and of the heights we can attain. Here he is, Sam Kellerman, the best of 10,000. Within a short time, Sam and James had discovered a shared interest in rap music. Sam was from a more affluent part of the city, and among his four brothers is the world-famous sports analyst Max Kellerman. While Sam was training at the gym, he was also in a rap group with his brother Max, and they had gained chart success with their song Young Man Rumble. Butler was invited to appear in the music video for that song, but after several hours of filming, Butler left the set early, grumbling about the long hours and the lack of pay. Years later, Sam and Max were instrumental in Butler regaining his license to box again, following his release from jail. Max never truly considered Butler a friend, but soon after that sucker punch incident, Max had defended him in an article he wrote for ESPN, stating that, quote, The emotional response to the effect of Butler's punch has led to a reaction whereby the suggested punishment is all out of proportion with the crime. To suspend his boxing license for more than one year would not be right. The Kellerman brothers campaign proved successful and as a result, the New York Boxing Commission had granted Butler a license to box again. In contrast, Sam's career was on an upward trajectory. He had become a self-taught Shakespearean scholar, writing and directing several plays, including one called The Man Who Hated Shakespeare. He had gained some fame and directed three plays on Off Off Broadway. Sam had also featured in commercials with Willie Nelson and Christina Aguilera. He was in talks with MTV2 about hosting his own call-in show. The producers of the HBO series Entourage thought that Sam was charming and funny and were in the process of working him into the script for that sitcom. As a sports writer, he was happy to secure his first contract with Fox Sports as a regular columnist. 
And in this column, Sam had once written about Butler too, in the hope of strengthening his career trajectory with some positive media exposure. In the column, he describes Butler's diagnosis, bipolar disorder, and his comeback after going to prison for the assault. You end up hurting people you love, he quoted the hammer as saying. They try to help you and you flip on them for some small thing. I've taken the classes, read the books, I know what to do. You can reach a level where you don't need the medication anymore, you just have to be strong-minded. So when Butler reached out to him in 2004, Sam agreed that he could stay in the apartment but with the understanding that it would be for a few days in the manner of a short vacation. The apartment was already occupied by another guest, an aspiring actress named Beatrice Quinones. But in that Fox Sports column Sam wrote, he had asked the world to give the hammer another chance, so how could he himself refuse? When Butler phoned Sam prior to moving in, he'd explained that his life was in a shambles. He was on the verge of splitting up with his girlfriend Chase Mariposa. He really got to see his newborn son Zaire. His previous trainer, Buddy McGirt, was no longer interested in training him. He was broke and had no place to stay. In late September, James arrived and crashed out on Sam's couch. Days turned into weeks and James grew jumpy and irritable. One moment he seemed depressed, the next moment animated and talkative. But he wouldn't take his medication, as his side effects severely impaired his effectiveness in the boxing ring. He had been reissued his license to box, and by this time he'd already accumulated four fights since resuming his career earlier that year. But now, after weeks in Sam's apartment, he had developed a habit of watching TV constantly, making it hard for Sam to concentrate on his writing and his work. They began arguing over little things, and within those few weeks, Beatrice felt the tension steadily rising, so she packed up and moved out of the apartment. Another friend, Claudia Salinas, returned to Sam's apartment with him on October the 11th after a dinner engagement. They found Butler slumped in the easy chair, transfixed on the television. Sam had planned his night in advance and had returned to the apartment at this particular time to watch a game which he had to report on in his upcoming column. After asking James if he could change the channel in order to see how the game panned out to finish his story, James simply answered with a point-blank no. After further pleading, explaining the urgency of the situation in relation to his job, James growled at Sam to wait until the commercials before changing the channel. Sam went for a brief walk with Claudia and told her that the situation with James had fallen into this strange pattern very quickly. It's like this all the time, he told her as they parted ways for the night. After this, Sam tried to reason with James, saying that he didn't want to evict him, but the possibility was becoming more realistic if James didn't just leave with the same friendly spirit in which he had been received. But later that night, while Sam was sitting at his computer, typing for his column, James slowly crept up behind him with a weapon in his hands. A week went by, Sam's friends and family hadn't heard from him, and when he hadn't returned any of their calls, they grew increasingly concerned. So on October 17, 2004, Max Kellerman called a family friend who lived close by to Sam to check on his house. Steve Schneider visited the apartment and reported back to Max that the doors were locked, the blinds were down, and the car was gone. Max initially thought that since Sam had been taking Butler to gyms around LA when he first moved in weeks ago, perhaps Sam had gone to Las Vegas with Butler to try to find a fight for him, or for some other reason connected to helping Butler progress in his boxing career. But after further failed attempts at contact, Max asked Steve to check up on Sam once more. Steve visited the apartment again, this time with his girlfriend. When there was no answer at the door, they found an access point through an open window. After climbing through the window, they started calling his name, but after venturing a little further through the apartment, they spotted a grisly scene on the floor. A blanket was thrown haphazardly across a body, and leaned up against a nearby wall was a hammer covered in blood. 
A short time later, at 9.45 p.m., Detective Elizabeth Estupinian of the LA Police Department responded to a frantic call and entered Sam's apartment. She discovered Sam's body wrapped in a woolen blanket. Dried blood covered his battered skull. It was later determined that Sam had passed away five days earlier on October the 12th and he had been struck 32 times with the hammer that was left behind. Sam's car, a Cadillac Seville, was missing and there was evidence of someone trying to set the apartment on fire. The gas stove was left on and there were burns in Sam's carpet. It was speculated that the murderer had intended to engulf the apartment with gas and hoped that a spark from the carpet fire would ignite the gas, causing a gas explosion. Had this plan worked, there's no telling of how much devastation would have been caused if the fire had spread quickly throughout the apartment building. Hours later, the LAPD issued an All Points Bulletin, a message sent to all police officers who work in a particular region. The APB went as follows. James Butler, described as a male, black, brown eyes, black hair, 180 pounds, 31 years of age, is wanted for questioning in connection with the death of Sam Kellerman. Butler may be driving the victim's vehicle. There were a few sightings of Butler over the following two days, and his mother reported that he'd called her drunk, mumbling the same phrase over and over again. I shouldn't have done what I did. I shouldn't have done what I did. Then he abruptly hung up. On October 20th, three days after the murder and still roaming free, Butler visited a medical facility to seek treatment for his bipolar disorder. He was accompanied by his lawyer and it was at this point he telephoned the LAPD himself and told them that a few days earlier he'd gone for a short walk and returned to find Sam bludgeoned to death. He said that he had felt so distraught upon seeing Sam this way that he'd drunk a bottle of wine, filled the bathtub and slit various parts of his body with a razor blade while laying in the water, hoping to bleed to death. He didn't recall trying to torch the apartment and claimed that he was innocent. Butler was quickly apprehended by the police and was charged with first-degree murder and arson. His bond was set at $1.25 million. Butler sat in Men's Central Jail for more than a year awaiting trial. In March of 2006, Butler and his lawyers worked out a plea deal. He pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter and arson. On April 5th, 2006, Superior Court Judge Michael Pasta sentenced Butler to 29 years and 4 months in the California State Prison in LA. He will be released in 2035 at the age of 63. Four months after Sam's death and still consumed by grief, Max Kellerman was quoted as saying the following poignant words. You grow up believing as a kid that the world is here for you. And the fact that the world is still here and Sam isn't. And that there are six billion people alive and Sam's not one of them is unbearably hard to accept. Sam never gets to have a family, have a career, grow old. It isn't supposed to be that way. Luke Skywalker doesn't die in the first half of the movie. It's like a struggle with my own sanity. 15 billion years from now, if time reverses, I'll see Sam again before the big crunch. Once you're dead, a million years is no different from a second. So Sam and I will be separated for 50 years or so. Then there'll be nothing. And after that, billions of years later, I'll see him. Or I think about string theory and maybe, if I concentrate hard enough, I can get to a parallel universe and Sam will be there. But it's all a charade. Mental gymnastics to make me feel better. The arrow of time goes forward. Sam exists now only in memory.
So, thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Life and Death. Please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification all bell. I'm a brand new channel as of now, November 2021, and I'll be covering more stories of this nature, as well as articles and thoughts on weird science and maybe a little bit of supernatural stuff too, now and then. In fact, I'll probably be venturing into a few different areas with this channel, but it should all involve an element of intrigue, wonder, fascination, suspense, that sort of thing. If you'd like to support the channel, check the links in the description below. Until next time, take care and sweet dreams.